Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Bjorn Holmberg. I'm the director of the International Secretariat of the Challenges Forum. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you all. Uh, we will today host uh, a webinar uh, on the topic supporting peace operations, the importance of enhanced weapons and ammunition management. Uh, as you know, those of you being Challenges partner, we are a partnership of 50 partners in 23 countries aiming at improving the effectiveness of peace operations. And doing so, we are now testing a new modality, which is using webinars to have a much broader reach and also a, a, a lighter environmental footprint. And uh, this will be the first of a series of webinars, uh, mainly focusing on action for peacekeeping and the process of improving the effectiveness of peace operations. The uh, reforms initiated, initiated by the Secretary General last year in March. Uh, but today we have a specific topic, which is also important when it comes to effectiveness and integrity of peace operations, and that is uh, weapons and ammunition management. Uh, I welcome you all, all, but I would like to give a special welcome uh, to our moderator today, who is Sharon Mihalta, who is Senior uh, special Specialist on Peace Operations at the Secretariat. And you will introduce the panelists and uh, help us kick off this webinar. So please, Sharon. Thanks, Bian. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to um, introduce Eric Berman, the Director for Small Arms Survey, who will kick off um, a presentation on uh, this very important topic, um, the importance of enhanced weapons and ammunition management. Um, Eric, uh, as I mentioned, is the Director of Small Arms Survey, and most recently authored um, Beyond Blue Helmets, Promoting weapons and ammunition management in non UN peace operations. Uh, this is the. Um, and uh, in addition to um, this position, he has previously served in UN field missions um, and has published uh, extensively um, on peacekeeping and small arms uh, issues. So, Eric, um, welcome. Um, joining us today also is uh, Arthur Butelis, who is a non-resident senior advisor at the International Peace Institute. So welcome, Arthur. Um, Arthur has also previously served in UN field missions and uh, most recently authored um, The Changing Role of Conventional Arms Control in Preventing and Managing Violent Conflicts for UNITEAR. Um, coming online soon um, is the um, senior researcher, uh, Dr. Stanley Joubert from the International um, Security Studies uh, in South Africa. And we hope to have him online very soon. So give the floor to uh, Eric. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Bjorn and Sharon. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at the Challenges Forum International Secretariat. I uh, thank you for this opportunity and also for the invitation to attend your annual forum, mm -hmm. um, which was very valuable for us last June in Montreal. Thanks also to uh, the two discussants. Uh, Arthur, it's been a while. I look forward to your comments, unless they're very critical. And uh, Stanley, uh, look forward to when you come on board. It's been a while since I've seen you as well. Although I know Arthur and Stan Stanley, uh, the peacekeeping practitioner and policymaking community may not be familiar with the survey. Uh, so I thought I'd just say a couple of words. Um, I'll just uh, uh, share so you get the presentation two seconds. Okay, presentation is coming up. Should be up. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I, as I was saying, I thought I'd just take a couple of uh, seconds to talk about the survey for those who are not familiar. Uh, we've been around for the last 20 years. Uh, we are, uh, based in Geneva, Switzerland at the Maison de la Paix. That's the photo there that's on the screen. And we're an associated program of the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies. Uh, we have a mandate to look at all aspects of small arms and armed violence issues. And what we strive to do is to provide evidence-based, um, impartial, policy-relevant research and analysis so that we can help governments design policies to reduce the illicit proliferation of small arms and reduce the incidence of armed violence. Maybe you have to do that. Yeah. Oh, there it goes. Hmm. Um, I've organized my short presentation today into three parts. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about why this subject is important. 
Uh, second, I'm going to talk about what the survey is doing um, to address this challenge. And then the third section will be on how we can improve on the current practice and assist uh, the policy um, making and the practitioner community of peacekeeping to do their work. Uh, next slide, please. So I need to start out and just say why we've done this, because in engaging other communities, uh, there's been a disconnect or um, an impression or an assumption that we're saying that the loss of weapons and ammunition uh, in peace operations is the biggest problem facing uh, communities and countries in conflict or facing the peacekeeping mission. Uh, isn't it? Um, it's a problem. It's a bigger problem than people had understood to be the case than when we started this uh, seven or eight years ago. Uh, but it's really out of a respect for the fact that peacekeeping is important. Uh, Sharon commented about the fact uh, that I had peacekeeping experience when I used to work for the UN. I've been in Cambodia 25 years ago and have probably visited and done research in a dozen uh, missions since then. But the challenges of what you're facing today compared to what we did in Cambodia um, a generation ago are vastly different, vastly more challenging. And um, we felt that if we looked at this and we had a dialogue with the donors, with the practitioners, with the troop contributing countries, with the bodies that are authorizing these missions, that we could improve on practice. Whereas other flows of weapons that come into a conflict zone, uh, you wouldn't be able to have a dialogue or change that dynamic. So um, next slide, please. So what's the scale and scope of the, of the problem? And what we have in front of us is just some selected incidents of notable acts of diversion, of loss from um, peacekeeping missions over the last uh, 20 plus years. And what you can see is that uh, it's not infrequent and it's not um, uh, inconsequential. We're looking here at missions that have been undertaken by the United Nations and about 10 other organizations in which uh, they've lost considerable um, weapons and ammunition uh, in the course of their operations, not only contingent on equipment, but also material that they've recovered. And uh, what do we mean by notable incident? A notable incident is 10 or more weapons or a thousand or more rounds of ammunition in a single incident. And that's because we don't try to count every time that a patrol might be stopped and some weapons or ammunition are seized. Uh, and we'll talk more about uh, specifics, but this is not just a UN issue, as Sharon said. The last study that we did was uh, looking only at missions that have been undertaken by actors other than the UN. Um, so uh, let's go to the next slide and go into specifics. Um, so, so, you know, why is this um, important? And I think the answer can be found in the Action for Peacekeeping, uh, which talks about improving the safety and security of peacekeepers. Uh, uh, General DeSantos Cruz in his December 2017 report talked about uh, the increased uh, number of attacks and fatalities of peacekeepers. I think more than 1,000 um, had died and the trend was going up. And that was in UN peacekeeping. If you talk about other missions, uh, the numbers are significantly greater. Um, so this is a, a real concern why you'd want to go and reduce the number of small arms and the uh, amount of ammunition that's circulating in the, in the mission area. Strengthening protection uh, provided by peacekeepers. Uh, protection of civilians is difficult enough um, and made only more difficult by increased number of weapons uh, in the hands of negative forces. Um, I won't go through each one here, but uh, the issue of performance and accountability, I'll just say on that, you really do need data and you need baselines. And on this, we'll touch maybe more about it during Q&A or from the discussions. If there's a troop contributing country that's um, lost material, it doesn't mean that that's a bad troop contributing country because we're trying to make peace operations more effective. And if um, you want to have no losses, then you don't deploy. And that's not going to make countries more effective. 
What we need to understand is what's occurred, why it's occurred, and how we can um, improve. But this isn't a naming and shaming exercise. Uh, it's an understanding so that we can improve on current practice and take advantage of good practice where it exists and build on it. Also, I should say about the improving peacekeeping partnerships, um, there's a lot um, that's spoken about this. I'm gonna give some examples of some specific things that we might do moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we know uh, this? I showed you a, a map that had 50 incidents. Um, the data set that we have has a couple hundred incidents of attacks on peacekeepers, which is not complete. It's just what we've been able to compile so far. But we've been at this for the last eight years, and we have three studies. Uh, Sharon showed the most recent one, Beyond Blue Helmets. Uh, but you'll see on the screen the first one from 2015, Under Attack and Above Scrutiny. It's also available, besides in English, they're all available in English, that's in, uh, available in Arabic. Uh, but we were able to uh, show that the number of attacks were much larger than had been understood in the AU mission and the UN hybrid mission and the UN missions in Sudan and South Sudan during the period 2005 to 2014, that the amount of loss was much more substantial than had been understood. And something that we learned from that exercise was that uh, we went in without even asking it as a question, and that's the oversight of recovered material was um, a gray area. We spoke to a number of force commanders, and they said that within DDR, oversight is pretty good. But outside of DDR, uh, they always had to start from scratch in addressing material that um, troop contributing countries recovered. And then how do you deal with that when there wasn't a political framework to deal with that? And then sometimes that stuff um, would be redistributed or sometimes wasn't accounted for the way that it should be. Then the question was, well, that's interesting, but maybe that's an outlier. Maybe the situation in Darfur is particularly problematic. So we did a subsequent study that looked not comprehensive A to Z, but certainly expanded and what we were told was that the assumptions we made were um, very conservative in terms of the losses, the number of attacks were greater, the number of attacks that resulted in losses were greater than what we had, and that the amount of material that was lost was greater. As an anecdote, but what makes the point is someone said, do we have something in which we are um, shielding the UN or the AU from criticism? because people thought that uh, we were minimizing the actual problem. Um, and then we also learned that the oversight was quite limited um, across the board. So the th last study that we have is that there's a new fourth category of at least 500 weapons or more than 100,000 rounds that are lost in a single attack. Um, and so uh, it's big and a lot is going on in MNJTF in Northeast Nigeria, in um, Amazon. And so that's how we know what we know through key informant interviews, through meeting with practitioners, and through um, directed study for the last seven years. Next, please. So what the survey has done um, is undertake, with the last three years, a project called Making Peace Operations More Effective. And uh, the focus for the first phase, which was through March of this year, was really uh, to focus on evidence-based research and analysis and uh, agenda setting. We've had a number of workshops, um, talk a bit about those. We've had uh, work that we've done with uh, troop contributing countries from the Global South. And uh, we've had uh, research that we've undertaken. So we're really learning from the practitioners. But now we're moving in the second phase since April um, for capacity building. So the focus right now is much more to support the troop contributing countries, to support the regional organizations that we work with, to develop their capacities uh, to address this issue. Uh, next slide, please. And this just gives you an idea of um, some of the countries that uh, have, and some of the regional organizations uh, that have supported this effort. Um, we really appreciate that assistance. Uh, next. So moving forward, uh, we're going to take on a number of uh, training efforts. Um, I see Juliette, that you're online or signed up. Uh, 
first one, which we'll talk about in a minute, is at the National Defense College in Nigeria, um, a training center of excellence for ECOWAS. Um, and that's, that's a really important initiative. In the past, we've done a lot of sensitization, um, senior mission leaders, um, but uh, this is the first time we're doing something that's gonna be, um, I hope to repeat, and I'll talk about that in a second. We're also working with regional organizations to operationalize some of their frameworks and policies. I'll go into more detail on that. Uh, we'll continue with some studies, uh, but it's not as much of a focus. I'll talk about the peace operations data set that I've alluded to, and I think I'll close on tapping into existing expertise, which is why I'm so excited about the opportunity you provided today. Uh, next slide. So this first course that will, be, will occur in November it responds to um, a declared need by ECOWAS, uh, Economic Community of West African States, and many of its uh, member states that participated in the first regional workshop that we held in uh, April of 2017. And they said that there's courses um, for physical security and stockpile management. There's courses maybe on intelligence or uh, record keeping and folks uh, who know about uh, the program of action on small arms. And, but to put it all together, uh, it didn't exist. And so, uh, we were very pleased that we've had the opportunity to design this three-day uh, course. And as I said, it will be held for the first time in Abuja in November. And we already have a commitment uh, to do this uh, next year at another training center of excellence, at the Kobe Anand Center. And we hope that we'll do that in other regions as well. Uh, so we can answer, I can answer questions about this, but it's just important to know that this is going to be a significant um, piece of the puzzle moving forward. Uh, and I think on the slide, you can, they can see the seven modules um, on, on the slide. We can bring it back up if you have questions. But let me turn to the next, uh, next slide. So I mentioned about the existing frameworks that exist. So uh, we work with regional organizations. Uh, ECOWAS and ECOS are the two that are listed here. Another one that isn't listed here is the African Union, where we've worked with them the last um, year and a half to develop a new policy on recovered weaponry. So we might go into that in questions and answers. But in the interest of time, in terms of what's happening, Article 11 of the Small Arms Convention of ECOWAS is a, a tremendously important uh, tool um, and commitment. It's been legally binding now for 10 years. And as we know, some of the most active troop contributing countries are from ECOWAS, both in the UN uh, missions, as well as in ad hoc coalitions of the willing, AU, ECOWAS um, missions, Lake Chad Basin Commission for the Multinational Joint Task Force. They're very, very active. And what Article 11 says is that any member state that deploys in a peace operation has to record what they bring in, what they resupply, what they recover, what they destroy, and what they take away. And that's just black and white. That's what the, the member states agreed to back in 2006, and that's what entered into force in 2009. And implicitly, it means that whatever they use or whatever they may lose would be the delta that's missing from those various components. So that is far above the demands of what the UN asks uh, but the ECOWAS Commission, to my understanding, doesn't receive very much information. And you need that information because then you can have a dialogue. Then you can understand what's going on um, and what may be found elsewhere, what's missing. Uh, so it's a great, great, great tool, but it's underutilized at present. ECOWAS recognizes this, and so they've worked with us to develop a reporting template, and we're moving forward with them so that we could make this something that's um, live and being used. And as I said, it's already politically accepted. ECOS has something called the Kinshasa Convention. ECOS is the Economic Community of Central African States. Um, that is legally binding since 2017. They have 11 member states. Chad is very active, Cameroon's very active. They've had um, others, I don't mean to not, not say that the other nine countries haven't participated, but these are important um, actors in peacekeeping. 
They have in Article 22 something that's similar. They need to have a peacekeeping database. And uh, what that contains isn't quite clear. Maybe they take advantage of best practice that um, ECOWAS has and, and say that what it means is what Article 11 means. Maybe they go past it and spell out what they use and what they lose. Has to be dealt with by the executive secretary of that organization and its member states. They had a first meeting of conference of state parties um, a year ago, June, and they'll have another one next year. And they're trying to unpack this. But these are important because um, the MMJTF it comprises member states from ECOWAS and from ECOS. So the Lake Chad Basin Commission may not be the most um, active or robust historically organizer um, of peace operations, but now they've got 10,000 um, troops from five of their member states that are deployed and they can take advantage of what ECOWAS and ECOS have done or are doing. Um, so how do we how do we make these partnerships vibrant that have been discussed in a 4 p Next, please. So I mentioned about pods, peace operations data set, the importance of, um, it's just not accountability again, but to understand what's going on. And so we have assembled a couple hundred um, attacks on peacekeepers and where there have been losses. Um, and casualties, of course, um, and so I know it's sensitive as a result that we're talking about loss of life often, not always, but often loss of life. And then on top of that, now you're asking about loss of material. Well, it's something that needs to be discussed and something that needs to be understood. So we continue to develop this and it improves because practitioners themselves recognize its importance and that they contribute. But it's very much a uh, um, in exercise uh, in the early stages. And I should mention the government of Sweden has been very involved in supporting the development of that tool. Um, much more can be done. Uh, so have a look for those participating in this um, discussion and I hope to talk about that more. Next and last slide. So um, I've talked about several components of uh, things that can be done or are being done. Uh, let me close by talking about tapping into the existing expertise. Seven, eight years ago when we uh, started this exercise, it was very sensitive. Um, the feeling amongst many of our interlocutors who undertake peacekeeping and uh, participate in it or responsible for overseeing it, uh, paying for it, is that what was less than best practice was basically known. It wasn't so great. If we talked about it in a very open manner, it would be highly embarrassing for those who had had challenges and um, they were making the best of a difficult situation. Eight years later, we're now at a point where what people thought was going on, they now recognize they didn't understand the full extent. We haven't given them the full extent. We've shown that it's more than what was understood. We've also shown that it's not too sensitive. The, the troop contributing countries that are having um, are being attacked or losing material and losing lives, they're the ones on the front lines. They know that they can do better, that they need to do better. Um, and it's not just wrong place, wrong time. It's not just um, an unfortunate thing about a difficult exercise. That happens. There are times when it is the wrong place, wrong time, and it's a bad day at the office, not to minimize, you know, it's not your behind your desk nine to five kind of job. But they recognize that it's um, maybe poor training, poor equipment, uh, poor intelligence, um, so many, so many other things that can be changed. Uh, maybe the mandate um, makes it difficult to do what needs to be done. So there's politics as, as well. So it's very complicated, but um, having this opportunity to reach out to the community of practitioners that the Challenges Forum mm -hmm reaches out to and, and brings together uh, is an exciting opportunity, we hope, so that we can learn from you and take this forward uh, as we move forward into phase two. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, Arthur, you've, you've heard um, Eric's uh, presentation. And um, I wonder if, um, and this is also for Eric to consider as we, as we move to the next sort of the next part of the webinar, the dialogue uh, session, 
Um, just from the brief description that Eric has provided and from your um, experience um, in the field and in, in working on policy issues, um, do you think um, that the loss of uh, material or diverted material um, coming, where should the focus uh, be right now in a context of um, operations operating in more non-permissive environments? Is a loss of material, um, should, we be should we be looking at loss of material um, during patrols, for instance, when they recover uh, material? or focus more on building capacity of um, what uh, individual TCCs should do um, during attacks. Mm -hmm. um, Arthur, perhaps uh, at the back of your head to consider this as you um, respond to Eric's presentation. Sure, well, uh, thanks uh, uh, Sharon and Bjorn for, for having me and, and uh, uh, congratulations Eric on, on, uh, on this latest uh, uh, report. <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, I start by, by praising maybe the, the, the work of, of Small Arms Survey. Uh, I mean, I enjoyed Small Arms Survey's work in general, uh, but I think th on this issue, it's, it's typically uh, raising attention on an issue that nobody else is, is really, uh, has, has really paid attention to. I remember, you know, being, being involved in some of the early discussions, I think, when, when Eric was scoping, uh, it wasn't easy. Uh, uh, so it's really good to see that it's it's coming to fruition, and 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 that you're able to do, uh, you know, help the UN uh, with some of the work that is maybe not able uh, uh, or not willing uh, uh, to do, and you know, for for good and 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 uh, for, for many good reasons. Uh, there are many priorities for the for the UN. Uh, one, the the big one right now is in those environments that you mentioned, Sharon, is, is safety and security. Uh, of course, there's an issue of, you know, unreported issue. Uh, uh, as you mentioned, you're doing a lot of, lot of interviews for, you know, uh, with practitioners to be able to get to these issues. Uh, uh, the UN, through its formal uh, uh, board of inquiries or, or COE inspection, you know, contingent equipment, are not necessarily picking up uh, uh, those issues. And of course, there's the issue of how sensitive it is with, you know, and how political it can get with troop contributing countries. Uh, uh, and already the, the sexual exploitation abuses uh, issue is, is you know, so front and center, it's, uh, uh, it's not necessarily easy to bring another uh, 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 skeleton uh, out, of the, uh, out of the closet. Uh, but maybe to answer your, your question, uh, um, Sharon, more directly, uh, WAM in general, I feel, weapons and ammunition man uh, uh, management, is definitely getting a lot of lot of uh, visibility the last few years, much more uh, than it used to uh, in the UN. Uh, uh, but you know, maybe from a different angle, uh, mostly of course from the DDR angle. And there's a, there's a handbook that that came out recently, uh, and also maybe because of a, of a bigger issue than than uh, peacekeepers themselves uh, managing their weapons, which is national forces managing their weapons. Uh, and you know, in a number of theaters where peace operations are deployed. Uh, a big part, as we know now, uh, uh, you know, a big part of the, the supply of weapons and ammunition uh, uh, to armed groups, including terrorist groups, is not necessarily from, uh, um, uh, from the outside, uh, definitely not from peacekeepers, but definitely uh, in large part from the stocks of the, of the National Defense and Security Forces. Uh, now, I think Eric's, uh, uh, what I perceive as, as, a, as a sort of maybe a, a, a novel focus on, on recovered weapons, I think is definitely uh, uh, very uh, relevant. Uh, it is becoming a, a big issue uh, uh, for, for a number of, um, of those operations. Uh, of course, the, the offensive African uh, uh, Union or MNGTF, as you mentioned, uh, probably in the future, the Joint Force G5 Sahel, but also because the UN itself, you know, uh, from the FIB to, to the, the MINUSCA, uh, you know, more, more offensive operations is recovering uh, more weapons. And, and on this, I think there's a, there's a real issue. Uh, but again, I think it's, it is definitely worthwhile uh, also strengthening uh, uh, one of, of peacekeepers themselves, but there, uh, and I think that's the, the direction that I'm glad, you know, Small Arms Survey is really turning this findings now into training because that's what the issue is. It's really a pre-deployment issue. Uh, it's a national SSR and WAM issue. Uh, you know, there's so much that those TCCs need to do once they're in operations, 
you can't really do remedial training on these things. This is basic soldiering. Uh, you know, this needs to be done before, uh, uh, before deploying. Uh, and I think, you know, once you're in, in, in theater, this, this should, just be, should be dealt, it should have been dealt with. Uh, maybe to, to, um, to throw a question back at, uh, uh, back at Eric, maybe some of the others, uh, um, you know, you emphasize rightly the, I think, a great opportunity for, for raising this issue further of the agenda uh, with the, the new focus on performance, uh, of course, performance of contingents, uh, uh, but also more broadly performance of mission with the new CPAS, uh, you know, being rolled out. And I was wondering in your interactions with the UN, whether you were able to, you know, uh, try to fit in uh, that issue as part of that discussions on, on performance effectiveness, uh, and, and maybe even more specifically, whether, you know, uh, the pods, uh, you feel could be uh, could be factor in as as part of the uh, the broader uh, discussion. Again, in a, I think that you highlighted rightly the you know in a positive spirit, not not to you know point fingers and, and to 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 focus on on you know bad you know uh, uh, poor behavior, but rather to to try to support those TCCs uh, for which now in addition to to all the things they already had to do, which is protecting civilians you know, uh, managing, you know, uh, uh, using and, and the weapons also have to uh, to face that issue of, of, uh, 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 of WAM uh, uh, because of the new situations they're in. I can't, I can't hear you anymore. Sorry. Back on. I, will. Sorry about I, I was saying nice things. I, I said that uh, I'm happy to do whatever Sharon wants me to do, but I took note of her question and your question, are there and I'm happy to listen to right. Stanley before pursuing it. So what's your sense of, um, we've looked a little bit, um, you covered both the UN and non-UN spectrum, mm -hmm. and given your extensive experience, Stanley, um, where does the, um, um, do you think there's a, there's a further um, need to socialize or to um, raise awareness of this issue in the um, AU context, or are there already, tangible um, concrete steps taken to address um, the issue so in response to your question sharon uh, certainly the attacks on fixed sites are very significant because we know in amazon in amos in um, g5 sahel the force conjoint um, of, of that mission and also the mnjtf there's been significant attacks that have resulted in companies being overrun mm -hmm. and in one case in uh, northeast uh, nigeria there were reports of a battalion uh, site being overrun and that means you're not just losing the small arms light weapons mm -hmm. ammunition you're mm -hmm. losing conventional weapon systems you're losing armored vehicles um, not to mention fuel and the mm -hmm. non-lethal material which is something we didn't talk about but could talk about moving forward is also very important. Mm. Uniforms, mm. Um, comm gear. Uh, so that's another aspect. So in terms of the big numbers of losses, um, fixed sites are very attractive. Um, now you can have patrols or movement, um, you know, convoys where you might have uh, uh, platoons or companies that are in movement that can result in quite a significant amount of uh, material that's lost. So you, you have to look at both. Uh, but just a little bit of feedback. Uh, resupply efforts sometimes come mm. under attack. It was the incident in 2008 in April where 12 tons of ammunition um, on the way to Darfur were seized and taken um, on the way from Port Sudan. Uh, Port Sudan. So that's a lot. Mm. I mean, that's uh, 600,000 rounds of ammunition. That was a bad day. Um, not that was not the UN's problem, other than it was a private company that perhaps wasn't the right private company to use. Uh, Arthur, in your questions about how things are going with the UN, uh, there has been a change. Uh, the relationship is we used to brief um, from the very beginning, we had briefings once or twice a year at headquarters on what we were doing, so we were always transparent about this effort and. Uh, they did read some of the material. They, officers, officials did speak to us, but uh, it was very much uh, cautious. I won't say that there's great enthusiasm 
Uh, there's respect, there's an appreciation, and as you mentioned, there's new policies that are um, being created. And there's definitely a new approach at the UN to address some of these issues that didn't exist before um, within DDR, which um, FBA and others are working on, and even outside of DDR, um, and talking about recovered weaponry. So that's very valuable. They've contributed um, some of their, uh, their people. To, we had someone there, um, from OMA to the workshop we had for the Americas in Montevideo last October, and that was great. Um, and I think moving forward, as they now have these policies, there's gonna have to be training for these new policies, and they know that we are um, available or interested in supporting it. So uh, there's more open discussion, um, and this is very positive. There are new policies that are gonna have to be thought about how they become effective. Uh, but it's still very sensitive, um, some issues. So for the question you, rose, um, you raised about uh, performance and the indicators and the data set we have, uh, not everything we have is online. We could make certain things available, but there's a real tension there. They have to be respectful of their troop contributing countries. I don't think looking at these issues makes it disrespectful. I think it's a question of how you use it, and how we use it and how we use information, but it, it's not clear at all about how we would have that dialogue. Um, so that's still something to be discussed, worked out. They may take information we have about troop contributing countries and how things have gone in non-UN missions where they don't have that information. And maybe that's something that could be shared as part of their discussion with troop contributing countries. Uh, so maybe there's other ways to take information that we have that is policy relevant and it may be less sensitive for them but uh, it's an ongoing dialogue I'll just say that we're, we're making progress we also have General Adrian Foster who's joined uh, the survey as the strategic advisor for MPOME and he was the deputy military advisor he was force commander in MONUSCO he's got tremendous uh, knowledge and tremendous experience um, of, within the UN and has an understanding about uh, sensitivities and where there's space to operate and where things might not um, need to be repackaged. So uh, we are excited uh, about the prospects for moving forward, but it's in the early stages. I think that's a way to describe it. I want to pick up on uh, Arthur's point about um, national forces in um, What's, what's your sense, and, and Arthur, feel free to jump in and expand as well. Um, you know, it's, it's usually um, WAM weapons and ammunition management is often an issue that's sort of down, further downstream in SSR. Um, is it both your sense that we should move this issue further upstream, um, taking in terms of um, um, sequencing of uh, issues to, to address with? Um, national um, authorities. Should we turn to Arthur? Is yes, uh, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, I mean, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, uh, Sharon, you 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 rightfully uh, uh, said we need to bring warm up stream, and but I think it's it's being done uh, to some degree. Uh, already, uh, I think this is uh, the handbook, for instance, if you look at the handbook for DDR uh, in WAM, it's interesting uh, because, yeah, it used to be dealt with, you know, WAM in the context of peace, uh, peacekeeping operations used to be dealt with as part of the, you know, disarmament and how you handle uh, uh, those weapons collected as part of the disarmament phase of, of, of DDR. Uh, and, you know, these days DDR doesn't collect that many weapons anymore. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, of course there are some other disarmament processes, uh, but what you know the the, um, the focus instead has been more on, on you know m how to reduce the violence by managing weapons. Uh, uh, of course the national forces, but even you know more upstream than that, uh, how you can possibly engage with armed groups during pre-cantonment cantonment phases uh, to try to start establishing uh, uh, you know weapons ammunition system. Uh, in place uh, so that there's no no you know no accidents but also no escalations and and you reduce the the, uh, the risks uh, uh, of violence um, 
in CAR in Central African Republic, uh, I think there's even there, you know, um, uh, efforts uh, really upstream uh, to try to uh, combine some kind of worm with the community violence reduction uh, program. So that's a, that's another example. Um, in terms of the how it links to SSR, there's some interesting work done by UNIDIR also uh, on uh, trying to, you know, how to use sanctions and, and sort of lifting of, of sanctions and arms embargo uh, uh, as a way to uh, sort of incentivize a proper one uh, as part of the, the process. So I think there are a number of, of initiatives and, and that's, that's definitely something. The other thing I would say, and maybe that, maybe that I'd like also to throw that at, at Eric, is that I think there is a greater awareness now beyond DDR in peace operations of the importance of looking at uh, small arms light weapons. And this project is definitely uh, uh, contributing to it uh, in some ways. Uh, but I think it's part of a, the, the issue is bigger. Uh, um, you know, we're seeing now with recovered weapons uh, from Central African Republic, uh, but also in Mali, that you know there is an increasing need in those environments to try to exploit, uh, to do better tracing. But still, the, those missions are not very well equipped. Traditionally, the panels of experts linked to arms embargo do some of that. Of course, the small arms servers of this world have been doing this work for, for a long time. Uh, but you know there's still not that many uh, JMAX that are equipped with that kind of expertise uh, to be able to link up with those more regionally focused panel of experts to partner with the uh, with those kind of organizations like Small Arms Survey. Uh, and I think it's important to continue raising uh, uh, these issues of, of weapons arms management across the board. Uh, the mission itself is contingent itself, but also as, a, as an analytical tool, as an important analytical tool. Uh, for the mission itself as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I uh, agree. Um, on weapons and ammunition management and national forces, the UN does a pretty good job uh, for pre-deployment um, and post-deployment checking on the material. They will go and check on the numbers. Um, I think Unmasked will also help out or look at good practice in terms of the safety and security. But again, we have to not make this against the UN. The UN does a lot of things um, best practice. They do a lot of things with resources and years of experience that are things to be emulated. And, but remember that Lake Chad Basin Commission, uh, my understanding is that they had a small you know, deployment or mission 10 plus years ago, and then they got into something that was a significant uh, mission, 10,000 troops and also um, in a very difficult environment uh, with challenges of co-deployed troops from the national um, armies alongside the MNJTF force. And LCBC does not have 70 years of peacekeeping experience to draw on for their checks and balances of um, either COE or of uh, recovered materiel. And recovered materiel is a significant issue from photos I've seen and discussing things with some of the sector commanders in that mission. Uh, besides good practice you were talking about, uh, International Ammunition Technical Guidelines is out there. We haven't mentioned that acronym before, so I just um, put it there that there's a lot to learn there and to take advantage of. But again, what the UN does, and uh, we can't just assume that's what other um, organizations that are taking peace operations and, and ad hoc coalitions of the willing that have um, fielded missions now and then what they have. Uh, and then goes back to some of the points you were making about the importance of intelligence, the importance of understanding the negative forces, their strengths, their activities, how they're sourcing their materiel. And that gets into what Arthur was talking about, about not every mission has that same analytical abilities. And civil society can certainly help. Um, with uh, there's panels of experts that are looking into arms embargoes, there's the um, units within the mission, and then you've got within civil society significant capabilities. Um, anyway, there's many besides a small arms survey that looks at these issues, and Arthur mentioned some of them, and they should be brought to bear to um, help with force protection and mandate implementation. Small uh, comment, and possibly to hear your reaction, both of you, Eric and Arthur. 
and Sharon. And I thought of, of Arthur's comment on, on uh, and also Sharon's question about upstream, that in the end, we put troops in the field and now in, in more intense conflict environment than traditional peacekeeping. And uh, in SSR, including defense reform and police reform, uh, we've spoken a lot about training, capacity building, equipment. But what has come from uh, UNODC, but also we discussed it over lunch here, and also from our partner DCAF, is uh, talking more about integrity of, of, um, of national forces. Uh, and that covers, I would say, uh, all of the, tr the troop contributors. I mean, uh, uh, what is the leadership you have? What, what are the conditions? Are the soldiers paid in time? Uh, are they giving the, the right uh, setting uh, for, for uh, contributing to the peace operations? And I think that is really upstream, uh, Sharon, as you asked, because that's not just to do things on the ground. It is how do we prepare and support um, uh, uh, troop contributing countries of, of really having uh, troops that that don't, don't only have high capacity but also high integrity and then we talk about uh, the, the spirit of, of, of the core we talk about leadership we talk about uh, the rights of, of the soldiers of decent conditions uh, and I think those things of course will always prevent uh, 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 the loss of weapons and, and so on and, and more robust reaction to, to attacks. And, and I think this is not just a question about um, resources for training troops, it's also uh, the, the experience of being in a combat environment, which could be different from different countries with that and, and without that experience. So there are a lot of different factors playing in. And of course, as you say, our control mechanism accountability and training are really important, but that needs, I think, to be combined with with the issue about uh, defense and police reform uh, with all the troop contributing countries mm -hmm. uh, independently. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, well, I wanted to um, come back to one of your slides um, where you listed a number of the um, thematics, how this issue fits in the overall action for peacekeeping. Um, partnerships was uh, one of them, and you've alluded certainly to um, perhaps greater uh, training, greater um, policy discussion between um, various regional organizations. Are there um, other um, um, mechanisms you think um, in terms of um, partnerships that could um, improve and address? Yeah. Uh, well, partnerships with civil society would be one. Arthur alluded to um, work that's being done by certain groups that would be of assistance with uh, action for peacekeeping goals. Uh, so you, you need to know uh, the, the environment in which you deploy and you need to know the various actors, uh, negative forces, uh, regional dynamics. And there's a lot that civil society can provide um, the peacekeeping operations. Uh, let's talk maybe about some of the, um, besides the UN, I talked about ECOWAS, I talked about ECOS. Um, European Union provides uh, significant support, the Africa Peace Facility, uh, and bringing them into discussions with some of these regional actors. Uh, can be enhanced. Uh, of course, you can always say something can be enhanced. We don't have the fullest information on every relationship that's out there. We just know that donors that are there providing for a troop contributing country, um, they should certainly be aware of some of the expectations of that um, country, uh, legal commitments that they've agreed to. And there should be a dialogue at least of how that's going. Uh, so that would be something that I think would be enhanced because greater transparency, greater dialogue, and I don't think that that's part of the dialogue currently. So let's take advantage of what the African Union is trying to do. Let's have the UN, if they're, they were both dealing with recovered weaponry at the same time, interestingly. Uh, but in other things, there's stuff that the UN is doing that other entities, other organizations um, might uh, benefit from. Uh, I bring up again, uh, well, G5 Sahel is a new actor, and Arthur mentioned that. 
I don't, uh, and you can define counterterrorism uh, or counterinsurgency operations. Peace operations is a very broad term mm -hmm. to cover a lot of different activities. But I don't know how much expertise from the UN or from other organizations is going to the troop contributing countries in the G5 Sahel. Maybe I turn it over to Arthur. But that, I'm talking about partnerships, a dialogue that maybe is happening, maybe isn't happening, but should be happening or could be happening. Uh, so I turn it over to others. And so maybe picking up where you left it, Eric, just, just there on, on, on the partnership, I don't know if I would call it partnership, cooperation uh, on the ground uh, between those forces. I mean, it's a quite sensitive topic at the, at the policy level. And, and it's, uh, we take the case of Mali, uh, 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 which uh, I know well uh, with Sharon for having served in that mission. There's been really an evolution uh, uh, throughout the time of the mission in terms of how MINUSMA has been working or not with the parallel French uh, counterterrorism force. Uh, but I think, you know, it's been a bit of, uh, you know, a uh, lot, of, lot of discussions on, on the terms of, you know, uh, coordinated uh, uh, joint operation with the national Malian forces and, and the French counterterrorism force. Uh, but the one thing that I think people have realized that needed to happen and has, I think, happened is, is uh, the sharing of information, especially on on uh, on exploitation, uh, especially on on IEDs, uh, so that's maybe something the, that could be uh, uh, built on. Uh, I think that the you know sharing of information on material recovered uh, goes beyond IEDs as well. Uh, uh, you know those those parallel forces are not always you know forthcoming and and don't necessarily you know, always uh, share all the information, including with the civil society uh, uh, NGOs. But I think when people realize that uh, what's killing peacekeepers are, uh, uh, is the same thing, you know, that's it's killing other uh, national forces and, and civilians, uh, I think there's a greater realization than the need to, to uh, share analytics, to do, you know, weapons intelligence uh, 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 together. So I think that's, that's definitely going in the right direction. But as you said, you know, not every mission has this kind of capability. Uh, just one arms expert in a, in a, in a JMAC, as we saw in, in Mali, can make a huge difference. And one arms expert in an SSR section, or what have you, because at the end of the day, uh, um, you know, it's it's and, and of course on the military side, uh, the growing uh, focus on on um, uh, these intelligence now. Uh, and the need for 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 actual uh, uh, military intelligence officers, including with those kind of uh, uh, skills and knowledge, I think is is uh, uh, is somewhat encouraging because that also provides uh, your peacekeeping mission on the ground the ability to be more credible uh, in cooperating and sharing information uh, with others who have usually much better uh, uh, information. Uh, the, the the introduction of also you know more uh, police intelligence. Uh, in, in peace operation with forensics lab uh, capability. Again, you know, uh, in many ways, Mali is, is uh, the mission, the mission Mali is leading, but others are also have, have gone that way. Uh, it also uh, presents a lot of, uh, lot of, of opportunities uh, in, in that sense. No, I think we could we can still open up for those that participate if they want to send us any question in the Q and A section. So maybe if Eric, you would like to reflect some on what some of what Arthur just said. Just before mm -hmm. that is this notion of um, you know you've you've raised a number of uh, key points there, Arthur, with this intelligence sharing of information um, nationally. Um, dare we? Um, consider sort of uh, a more regionalized uh, approach or sharing of information across missions in terms of at least um, some of these, um, if, we, if, we, if we talk about um, uh, mm -hmm. ammunition tracing, um, weapons intelligence, mm -hmm. just looking at the um, um, illicit arms uh, flows. So, um, well, uh, it's certainly, incredibly important to do so for um, reasons that we've discussed and flagged. Uh, my having been inside a mission area was 20, oh my goodness, 27 years ago uh, in Cambodia. So I know things have changed and I've read um, open source material. 
Um, I know what Arthur is referring to with some of the people he's referring to who are in these missions. And I hear that there are still challenges in, in terms of stove piping, in terms of silos in which information is, isn't shared. That's also true amongst, from what I hear and I'm told, but I don't have, I haven't published on this um, and it's anecdotal. And it, there's the challenge of certain troops um, to contributing countries that are deployed that have assets and have information and uh, they have their own restrictions on what they can share and with whom. So it's really complicated. And the question's a good one. The importance of doing better is clear. Uh, but specific ideas about how to do it, other than greater resources, or why can't we all be friends? Why can't we all? It's, it's complicated. I would say, or I'd ask maybe Arthur, who I, your things I've read of yours and the conversations that we've had, I think you're um, closer to what's happening on the ground uh, than I am. So maybe not to punt on this, but uh, I have it through reading other people's um, work. Arthur? Um, yeah, so, so on the on the on the regional uh, uh, question, I think maybe I'll start big, but with some, you know something that you've mentioned, Eric, earlier in the in the conversation. But you know, we we, we need to keep in inside that there there are legally binding instruments, uh, and there are regional legal frameworks that you know we can build on uh, uh, on this that that are I think quite useful in that they they do deal with a lot of these issues. Uh, uh, and that, in, in terms of the basis for engaging with member states and, and for training and so on. Now, at the level of, of operations, and, and the two needs to, of course, the two need to, they need to be a conversation between the uh, uh, sort of the, the legal obligations and, and, the, and sort of the return on experience from operational uh, uh, experience and, and, and lessons learned. There, um, I mean, as you, as you know, I'm going to state the obvious, but. Uh, um, it's still it's still a challenge for you know peace operations are still authorized within the limit of uh, and their mandate is within the limit uh, of a, of a country uh, you know that came up again recently in in the case of uh, of MINUSMA with the limited support it is authorized by the Security Council to provide to the G5 uh, Sahel Joint Force uh, you know it could not provide uh, uh, support uh, to G5 Sahel forces. You know that we're operating outside of the uh, area of operation meeting you could only support the Malian <laughs> defense and security forces which you could already support as part of his regular mandate um, but you know so so there's still a lot of challenges for regional approaches that said but, but again I mean I would <laughs> this needs to be a, 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 you know, a, a joint assessment because uh, uh, small arms service probably know uh, better I, my sense is that on panel of experts there's some positive uh, there are some positive evolutions. It used to be uh, uh, on the on the arms uh, uh, control aspect. Huh? Uh, it used to be very challenging, and and, the, and and peace operations on the ground, even though they were mandated to provide at least logistic support to those uh, panel members, were not always forthcoming for all kinds of all kinds of reasons. Uh, there seemed to be, you know, in the case of uh, at least on the on the broader Sahel, let's say. Uh, from Mali to Libya, Central African Republic, places where there's both a peace operation on the ground, whether a, a, a peacekeeping or, or political mission, uh, there seems to be uh, better relations uh, uh, with panel of experts, better uh, sharing uh, of information. What is not necessarily happening yet is, is, um, is sharing of information between uh, uh, peace operations. Uh, uh, and again, it's a, I think, you know, it's a chicken and egg uh, uh, issue. If you have the expertise, if you have a greater focus and credibility within the mission uh, on uh, issues of, of, uh, of weapons and ammunition uh, management, uh, tracing, and, and what have you, of course, you know, the, the, the regional, the, the, the cooperation will be better, the regional approaches uh, 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 will, be, uh, will be better as well. Okay. And so we have a question from uh, our um, webinar participants. Uh, sorry, thank you for that, uh, Arthur. Um, um, I think we're all um, familiar with um, the persistent challenges and certainly I think we all um, uh, continue to work on uh, confronting these uh, challenges and breaking down 
um, some of the limitations um, that, that require us to address uh, something that's uh, across uh, an issue like Seoul, which is a very much uh, cross-border transnational um, question. I'm, I'm going to read out the question, uh, Eric. Um, is there any strategy mapped out to accommodate civilians in managing these weapons and ammunitions? since most of the theft and damages are done within local communities. Um, for instance, in the fight against Boko Haram, where the MNJTF have been in operation for about five years now, we have um, challenges confronting both the troops and communities. Okay, okay that's got it. Uh, hi, Juliet. Um, I hope I'll see you in November um, in Buja. Uh, civilians are definitely affected. Um, you asked about strategies. I, I don't think that um, the Islamic State, West Africa province, uh, or Boko Haram are sourcing material from civilians, uh, certainly from police, from military, um, both within, from MNJTF and those national forces that are deployed alongside the MNJTF in Nigeria, Niger, Cameroon, and Chad. Um, the Beninois are the fifth troop contributing country, but they're at the headquarters. And um, but I, I don't know about civilians who could improve the management of their weapons. So maybe you can write back if I misunderstood the question. But what civilians can do is share information and concerns that they have about what's happening in their communities um, in terms of attacks on peacekeepers or the ab uh, forced abandonment of sites. Something that uh, Bjorn, you talked about was uh, morale issues and uh, security sector reform issues. This is something when you read the papers uh, in Nigeria and in uh, papers in the region and wire, wire service reports that a lot of civilians have expressed concern about the um, the performance of the uh, police and of the troops um, against the negative forces, against these insurgent forces, uh, because of just how much stuff is being lost and what is the reason for that. Um, and some of it has to do with uh, discipline, leadership, equipment. Uh, it's complicated. But in terms of the civilians losing material, uh, that I'm not familiar with on any large scale. But I take it from Juliet's question that it's what can civilians do to help improve the management or performance um, and, and add to the security. Uh, and that gets complicated. It's complicated. But uh, helping to better understand the situation certainly is part of it. Because uh, I'm not sure that everything we read is exactly what's happening. Um, one has to be careful about that too in certain areas uh, where there could be exaggeration or um, people with agendas to report on certain things. Uh, but Juliet, we can discuss this, I hope we will discuss this more um, this November. I see Thank notes here, I don't know which. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be another further question. No, I don't think we have further questions, so maybe we should start wrapping it up yes. if we don't have any other issues that you as moderator would like to raise. No, I don't. So let's um, see, mm -hmm. would you, do yeah. you have anything to? Well, just some final words. Uh, I'd like to refer, first, of course, thank you, Sharon, for, for moderating this. And to Eric from Small Arms Survey for you know providing us with a lot of ideas and, and fresh and new research that really shows that this is a, an issue for us all to, to think about and tackle. To Arthur for providing, of course, both field and academic uh, uh, experience on your reflections on this topic. And of course, Stanley for making his utmost of connecting, but we know that internet was not our best friend today. And this is what we might experience in the upcoming webinars from the Challenges Forum in the future too. We're gonna to work on this, this challenge. What I would like to say is that we're gonna to try to do more webinars ahead, and that's of course of, of, of making the Challenges Forum more active in its partnership, but also with experts like Small Arms Survey over the year in between our annual forums.
I would like to say that we are, have an upcoming meeting in uh, November uh, that will be uh, organized by uh, one of our partners, IPSS in Ethiopia. Uh, that will look at some of, of the A4P issues that we have touched upon before. Uh, I would also like to say that we are just about to report uh, above and beyond uh, the executive outcome report that was launched in July from the uh, last annual forum hosted by the Canadian government, which has actually a, a list of recommendations, but this will come in an updated version with more in-depth in recommendations that will be presented by the Canadian mission at the UN to member states, challenges partners and the UN uh, in the beginning of October. Um, and of course, the Challenges Forum and its 50 partners uh, will continue to uh, be a platform for discussion of issues of small arms and light uh, weapons control and ammunition, but also other issues that are raised now in the Action for Peacekeeping uh, process. So thank you to everyone uh, for being here, and we hope that you on the other end have enjoyed the uh, the transmission in spite of some technical difficulties, but I think we should think about the baseline being the missions uh, and their difficulties, and then this is a walk in the park that I think we can survive. So thanks for everyone, and uh, we wish you a nice day or evening or night.